Sportsman. Hello, sportsmen. Hey, on this program, if you watch this show, even if you don't see Big Buck Night, you still see lots of big racks. We have them in our trophy stories virtually every show. We also have taken trophies in the past. Well, didn't take a trophy this particular trip. Not a trophy anyway, but it's a trip that John Ford and I took in 1989, caribou hunting in Quebec. We're going to take, this is an exciting sequence, bow hunting. Stay tuned. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. The tundra south of Ungava Bay in northern Quebec is the land of the caribou. To the Inuit Indians, they're a source of food, and the herd in this part of Canada has been growing, some say too much for their own good. Hunters are allowed to take two caribou in an effort to trim the herd and balance with the long-term food supply. Traditionally, caribou have migrated en masse from summering grounds to wintering areas. But 150 miles west of Kujak, part of the herd has become somewhat resident, migrating back and forth, wandering. And this is where the camps of Safari Nordique are located. Caribou are plentiful. Each morning, our guide, Al Higley, originally from Hunt, New York, would shuttle us an hour from camp to a prime caribou crossing. Birds this far north aren't too common except for the grouse-like ptarmigan. A few bow hunters in our camp brought back ptarmigan for dinner, quite an accomplishment with a bow. hard it is to get a ptarmigan dinner with a bow and arrow. <laughs> I know, loud. I missed that. I missed them. Shot all my arrows twice. Ten times so far. <laughs> Very close. I could have chased ptarmigan all day, but we were there for caribou. And we had prepared excellent blinds for the camera and for hunting. We've seen several herds of caribou come from over the hill here, and I'm down in the valley that's right next to the river. You can see from John's camera blind the setting of this little clump of trees. Uh, they seem to cross from the other hill. Now, I'm sitting in a clump of spruces in here, which is just a beautiful little blind. I have my what I'm wearing, of course, my hat with a bill on it, because they keep the rain off of my glasses is a real problem. Suit has a hood, which is a lifesaver for keeping warm, keeping my back to the wind whenever I can. This is a Gore-Tex suit, which you need for the rain protection, including the rain pants. And my boots, have to use Arctic ice fishing type of boots with felt liners. Got my bow here over against a uh, limb. I don't knock an arrow until I see a caribou because there's no real need to, because uh, geez, the visibility is great. I sit over here on, a, on my bucket, which also keeps things dry, has a swivel seat. Uh, my mittens I put on when I'm cold, otherwise I'm ready for some action. Now this blind, the reason that we put it right here is out in front you can see crisscrossing trails, many trails from where the caribou cross the river. You can see behind me from the camera blind uh, a trail coming across here. In fact, John's camera blind is right up the hill. It's right almost on the crest of the hill and he's hunkered down so the caribou can't see him. It's a perfect setting caribou crossing from many directions and uh, hopefully we'll get one today. I hope. We sat and waited and then suddenly but quietly they appeared. They're going to they're going to win me. The wind is blowing towards them. Let's see what happens. 70 yards away directly downwind, the bull either sees us or wins us. He wants to come down to the lower plateau where I'm waiting with my bow and John Ford is behind me with a camera. While white-tailed deer rely heavily on their noses to detect danger, it's my conclusion that caribou rely far more on their eyes. Motion in the trees puts them at a distance. 
Your scent in the air, at least according to my experience, doesn't spook them nearly as much as you'd think. caribou around us for at least 15 minutes, but our moving in the blind, trying to adjust for better camera angles, must have been noticeable. Once one caribou was suspicious, the rest were on edge. Maybe we'd have better luck tomorrow. The next day, I was full of anticipation. In fact, too full. I sat in the blind hour after hour, glassing, watching, scanning, and saw nothing, but I had a theory. All those caribou that descended on the blind the evening before had to come from that plateau above. My curiosity was killing me. I wanted to explore that plateau on my own to see if I couldn't find a better spot for John and I to sit. While I stalked the caribou on the plateau, John stayed back at the camera blind, overlooking my empty blind. That's the clump of trees on the left. Can you believe this luck? All I would have had to do was be patient. Not 20 minutes after I left my blind, a large herd of caribou grazed its way up that valley by my blind, walked right past cameraman John Ford on the hill. They walked downwind from John not 20 yards. He was excited, and they seemed only curious. There's my blind, empty. I left my vests and heavy clothing sitting there, not a half hour old, not 10 feet from those caribou. They sauntered by on both sides. What does that tell you about patience? Well, after cruising by the blind that I so carefully prepared, the whole herd passed by John. This one, he says, should have winded him. It was downwind about 12 yards away. Perhaps it did, but it wasn't terribly frightened. Forty-five minutes later, I was back in the blind, and towards dark, I spotted two small bulls working along the river. I'd have to get closer for a shot, so I made a stalk. One spotted me, and I had a split second to make a running shot. All in all, I was pretty darn close. I think Fred Bear would have been proud of me. That arrow, as you can see, may have even bumped that bull's antlers. If not, it was just a whisker away. Was I disappointed? No, I was excited. I had a chance, and I came close. To me, that was a thrill with a bow and arrow, but not as big a thrill. As you'll see next week, I move in on this record book bull across that marsh and up that hillside. That's coming up next week in Caribou, the final episode. tell you that was exciting it's fun just being up there chasing the ptarmigan chasing the caribou you see lots of animals that's what's fun about heading up north like that before we get to the final segment i just want to mention this videotape was done in 1989 one of the early years of safari nordique's booking experience uh, we went back one or two years later but haven't been back since i hear they're still booking the price is about three times what it used to be uh, but there's still thrills to be had thrills like i had back in 1989 Watch this. We spent six days on the tundra of northern Quebec. Desolate country, but beautiful country. Ungava Bay to the north marks the land where the caribou roam. They migrate in the fall to wintering grounds, crossing many lakes and rivers that meander throughout the tundra. But they go right over the bank. In fact, here's some fresh tracks. Probably made not too long ago. Some fresh tracks leading right up they come right up through those rocks. Rather incredible, they're crossing from the other side over there. They come right through all these rocks and swim across this river, this current. Now why they don't pick their way through the shallower water, I don't know. The caribou don't avoid the rapids. It wasn't far from these waters where thousands died during the great North American floods in the fall of 1986. Putting meat on the table with a bow and arrow is not a simple task. Ptarmigan are grouse-like birds of the tundra. After chasing a flock, my tenth shot was the closest. We had spaghetti for dinner that night. 
Our quarry was caribou, and although I wasn't after a trophy with a bow and arrow, I certainly was thrilled to see huge bulls walking on the ridges. This bull I watched from a distance, but I couldn't get any closer than 80 or 90 yards. I did have a moment of excitement when two young bulls ran about 40 yards from me, and I got a shot. If you get close to your TV screen, you can probably see the white fletching on my arrow as it glides just over the neck of this bull. My most exciting moment came one morning when I least expected it. You guys won't believe it. John and I left to go over that knoll to the north, yeah. or whatever it is over there. And there's a little pothole there. And there's a caribou, a big caribou. Dead. I'm not kidding. No, no. I mean, with massive antlers. You know, laying down? I'm, no, it was feeding along around the edge of this. Uh, my heart's pounding. I said, John, John, you know, just stay right here. Somewhere as it was feeding around, it looked and stopped. The wind is perfect. It comes around the edge of this. Oh, man, my heart is pumping so bad. Let's stay right behind here. You want to stay back a little bit from me? Bull spotted us as we jockeyed for a better angle. The wind was perfect, blowing from the huge bull right towards us, but their eyes pick up movements in the trees. They're looking for wolves. I cautioned John Ford not to move whatever he did, but somehow I knew it was already too late. You can't imagine how my heart was pounding. A record book caribou, probably only 50 yards away, coming towards us. The camera is rolling, and he spotted us. But wait, if we hold perfectly still, he might calm down and continue walking around this little bog. So let's keep extremely still and quiet. Our hopes of a close-range 20-yard shot, which would have been a sure thing, are now dashed. The bull is spooked. But maybe the encounter isn't over. I saw a movie Howard Shelley did on the original Michigan Outdoor Show back in 1969. He showed an Indian guide raising his arms to imitate the antlers of another large caribou. And in his film, the big bull actually came towards the Indian guide and the camera to get a better look. If I stepped out into the open and raised my arms like I saw in Howard Shelley's film, would this big bull hold still or even come back to me? the caribou starts to circle, actually coming in for a closer look. Howard Shelley's film taught me well, but with my heart pounding, could I judge the distance and make an accurate shot? It looked to me like 35 or 40 yards, almost out of range. My arrow was on its way. In slow motion, you can see it against the sky at the top of its arc. But watch the caribou start to run before the arrow gets there. I saw the arrow land by the caribou's back leg. 
That ended four and a half minutes of the highest suspense I've ever had while hunting. A camera rolling behind my shoulder, a record book caribou making its way towards me, soon to be within 20 yards, finally the long shot that missed, but not by much. So did I ever get a caribou? Well, of course, everybody filled their two permits. On the last afternoon of the last day, I took two average-sized caribou with a rifle. But I was going for meat, so I was happy. We had all kinds of tales to tell in caribou camp. But the one experience that I'll relive time and time again was when I imitated a bull's antlers with my arms and actually got that bull to come back almost within range. That's a great story. Don't you agree? Tell you, that is a kick for me to look back upon these trips we've had in years past. They were fun. They were exciting. But you know, deer hunting in this state can be tremendously exciting. You don't have to get a big, massive bull elk or bull caribou or even a big buck to have it mounted. Uh, let's go for a moment down to Brad Bruce and his Wildlife Taxidermy Art Studio in Tecumseh. Take a look at some racks that are trophies to the people who got them. Well, this is a uh, grandson's uh, first bow kill, and granddad brought him in, and they're equally proud of it. And uh, you know, it may not be a big rack by yardstick measurements, but uh, <laughs> it's a big rack for them. First deer, first bow kill. Now that is a big deer. This is definitely a big one. This is a technically a 21 pointer, as as uh, we or all deer hunters talk, which would include all these points up here, of course, and then. Uh, these that are sometimes commonly referred to as stickers, but they would all count too. So it is a 21 pointer and it's certainly a, a dandy rack, knockout rack. Huh. And then we've got a few of these that uh, that come along. Uh, this happens to be a, what we call a pitchfork rack. Uh, and no explanation other than genetics or injury, but this is what he ended up with. So it's uh, interesting. And uh, another one uh, is pretty much in the same boat. And actually, these deer came uh, within the same area, but I don't think close enough to, to be related. But it uh, just goes to show you what can happen to some of these racks out there. Oh, I tell you, there are a lot of big, gnarly racks out there, interesting racks, unusual racks. People bring these, of course, to a taxidermist to have them mounted to to look back upon them, have them on the wall for the memories. We have a lot of them here at the museum, all different types of mounts, and, and that's all a part of hunting and the great outdoors. We also have, of course, in our Outdoor Digest magazine, uh, information on big bucks, where they are, where, when, and how to get them. Uh, last week I reported that two more state shooting ranges are scheduled to be closed now this year. That means three shooting ranges we've lost, big state shooting ranges, uh, within the last few months. That is why we are having a meeting. If you belong to a sportsman's club that has a shooting range, your shooting range is extremely important. I regard that as a resource as valuable as the Grand Canyon, something we can't afford to lose. Be sure you come to this meeting, your representatives, on the 10th of January. Call us if you need more information. And if you think this is just a man's world in the outdoors, tune in next week. We're going to take the ladies' side of the story. See you then.